if you're the sort of person who opens your calendar on a Sunday night just to have a peek at what horrors lie ahead and you've got 40 hours of back-to-back meetings and someone's put a meeting over your lunchtime walk and the time that you're meant to be going to collect something for someone, there's a meeting over the top of it. Then no matter how connected to other people you feel, no matter how robust you might feel about your life in other ways, um, that lack of personal control is probably the biggest predictor for human well-being. So, you know, and it, it has remarkable effects. People who have no autonomy in their jobs generally become more authoritarian parents. People who have no autonomy in their jobs uh, are more likely to have children who become school bullies. Welcome to Anatomy of a Leader, a video podcast that shows you that there are many faces of leadership, that perfection doesn't and shouldn't exist, and that making mistakes or taking detours can often lead to deep insights about your superpowers. My name is Maria Vorostovsky. I'm a headhunter and founder of HVO Search, and I help ambitious leaders hire the most in-demand, high-potential C-suite talent. Each week, let me take you on a journey to discover what leadership truly is and how you too can get to the very top. And in the meantime, help us reach 1,000 subscribers, hit that red subscribe button below and the bell icon so you don't miss a single episode. This show will challenge the way you think and may even change your life. Bruce, welcome to the show. Thank you. Thank you so much for coming. I've been very excited to talk to you because you're a best-selling author of The Joy of Work. Got a new book coming out, Fortitude, which I'd love to discuss. You're a podcast host, eat, sleep, work, repeat, and anything to do with workplace culture, which is what you have kind of carved out a niche for yourself, is fascinating to me. So would love to talk about your journey, the books, particularly about resilience, which is this kind of idea of kind of never quitting, never giving up. And that is a massive strength, but also when used in different contexts or overused becomes a weakness. And I see the parallel between that. And I just, you know, I find that topic fascinating. So mm. yeah, welcome to the show. Thank you. And um, let's go straight in there. You talk about this in your book, uh, The Joy of Work, about your first job. Is that what your fascination with workplace culture, is that where it comes from? Um, I, th- I think the interesting thing for me is that if, ever, if you've ever worked in any working environment, whether it's a bar, a hotel, a office, mm-hmm. very quickly, two things become clear. There's the job you're tasked with doing, and then there's the people who you do it with. And often while the job you're tasked with doing generally characterizes the way that you think about whether you can do this job, your capabilities of it. The people you do it with generally inform the experience that you have. You know, mm. if you go, and so this is what I was vividly aware of from doing bar work, is that you can do the same job, the same tasks, maybe slightly different clientele, but the people you do it with fundamentally change the experience. And so that was like really interesting to me. And I, my first office job was in a, quite chaotic organization, part of a big company, but like a sub part. But the the sort of connection, the esprit de corps between the people doing it was really palpable. And in fact, I knew people who were doing the same job, back to that bar metaphor, in a rival company, and they hated their experience. They, Mm. They were really beaten down by it in a sort of managed state of depression, I think a lot of them. And so that became really intriguing for me. What was it that made these two organizations doing the same job, one of whom was marginally more effective, one of which was more, um, just seemed to, to win more friends out mm. in, in the competitive market. And I was just really intrigued with that really. So, so that has always informed it. <laughs> the idea of trying to understand what characterizes those good workplace cultures has really been of interest to me. So what are the three things that make a really good workplace culture? I mean, you mentioned one thing, which is colleagues. And actually from my line of work, that's the one thing that I always kind of think about because, you know, whenever a person's sort of switching from one place to another, you know, can they fit in? And it's largely to do with who you work with. But Mm. apart from that, what are the other, I'd say, you know, other 
two areas that make an amazing workplace culture. Yeah, I, th- I think underpinning any good workplace culture is a sense of psychological safety, the sense mm-hmm. that you can speak candidly to each other, the, the fact that you can um, raise disagreements with each other sort of productively. So th- that psychological safety, really lovely evidence across, you know, Industries from hospitals through to hotels, through mm-hmm. to offices, through to airlines of, of how psychological safety informs things. I think um, then <laughs> probably what I would call positive affect, the, the mood that people are in, the people not being exhausted, burnt out, overwhelmed. Uh, that sense of overwhelm really characterizes a lot of work right now. Mm. Um, probably, you know, the, the big thing that probably holds all of it together is a sense of team cohesion, a sense of community. Um, and that, for me, is probably the, the defining part that really uh, sort of determines our experience, really, of organisations. Mm. If you work in a place that has got some sense of mutual uh, connection, trust, uh, which is related to psychological safety, but it's sort of transformational for your experience of, mm. of working in, in that environment, really. I definitely identify with that as a person who has worked in places before. And certainly having had this sort of, you know, you're kind of in cahoots with your colleagues, even though maybe your bosses are not mm. amazing, yeah. inspiring, or sometimes not necessarily that great. But that sense of almost like a belonging based on your colleagues is really powerful. And some of the guests who I spoke to as well in the past, it, it, it's a consistent thread. One of the things you said in the book is that workplaces end up thriving in spite of their bosses. I think that's what you said in Mm. the book. So can you thrive in a place where you have this amazing kind of colleagues, but your bosses are not? Yeah, (laughs) I I guess that's a key point. Look, ultimately, an organization will will thrive the most Mm. when everyone is aligned with the boss. And, you know, there is a sort of sense of connection that goes all through the organization. Mm -hmm. But I guess what I was really saying in the joy of work is that even if you don't necessarily identify with the top leader in the organization, that's not to say there can't be some sense of team cohesion below. You know, if you, I've worked in several environments where there was almost a disdain for the the top boss, Mm -hmm. but there was a sense with the team working below, look, we want to give good service to our customers here. We feel a connection with the people we're doing business with, and we want to do a good job for them and our colleagues even though we don't necessarily identify with our bosses. Mm. So that's it's a really growing issue, actually. What you find is that um, more and more, as wage disparity between people who do the day job and bosses grows, you know, and the multiple between what people who do an entry-level job and bosses, what, what they earn, as that multiple grows, you, what you tend to find is there's significantly less identification. The boss of Google, I think, earns about $100 million a year. Mm-hmm. And uh, so... He earns $100 million. If you're working as a start employee at any organization and your boss earns a thousand times more than you or whatever whatever that multiple mm. might be, then you reach a stage where um, you don't necessarily think he's on my side. And so as a consequence of that, you see really strongly people tend to identify with people who they can relate to. Mm. It, it makes a really big a point, I think, going forward, that if we can't necessarily relate to some of the people we're in an organisation with, that's when schisms start start developing in the culture. Mm. Well, it's like how empires fall, isn't it? When you have like a huge wealth divide between like the poorest and the richest. I mean, Ray Dalio has just written a, another book, The Changing World Order, and how empires rise and fall when they start. I'm not sure I fully down. trust that guy. Do you trust that guy? I've read his book about principles Mm. and um, yeah, I do. He's an accomplishment as a hedge fund leader. You know, the numbers speak for themselves. But there's there's some things about the way he tells his story that firstly don't connect with the the lived experience of the people who work in that organisation. On the record, you can go and read Glassdoor about people who work there. The turnover of people who join that organisation in the first year, over 30% of people leave. Um, Even some of the things that are on the record about it, Mm. describe it as sort of mass hazing. You turn up, that organisation for people who don't know, everyone in every meeting gives a score to each other. You know, if it was a episode of Black Mirror, it'd be this yeah. dystopian thing mm-hmm. that you'd be scowling at. In fact, this is their experience. Mm-hmm. What you find is that, firstly, he tells certain stories about that experience 
with such a mechanical repetition mm -hmm. that I'm not convinced they're true. So he will, you know, when he's asked about it, he'll always say, someone once gave me four out of 10 in a meeting. That's the story he always says, someone once gave me four out of 10. To the extent that I, I can only presume it only ever happened once that someone gave him four out of 10. This guy with immense force of character, a lot of people from there, mm -hmm. there was an Adam Grant episode where they recorded someone who'd, there was a leaderboard of all the scores that everyone's got in the organization. And the manager, the new manager who's sitting rock bottom, mm -hmm. who didn't last a year there. For me, this is, um, it's Mean Girls played out in sort of corporate finance. It's, it's just this horrible individualistic form of business. Now, look, mm -hmm. it might have achieved results with the hedge fund management and you know the current results of the organization are really poor he's underperforming most of his peer group but historically it might have achieved good results but i think what he is par excellence is a pr man and right now he's out telling his story he's positioning himself as this this figurehead i've got big question marks about whether he, there was an there was a, an article in the um, the financial times about him a couple of weeks ago i've got big question marks about whether he's quite what he says he is well, let's talk about that leadership aspect then. You know, you have a founder, a CEO of a business. What's their responsibility in creating the workplace culture? And does it always come from the top? Hey, look, you know, I, I think anyone who sets up an organization makes a decision mm -hmm. whether they want to optimize for the experience of employees or whether they want to, you know, optimize for probably the money they make or the size they want to get. So it's definitely a decision. Mm -hmm. And the people who might say that workplace culture is important, are the people who probably would say, okay, when we're trying to understand the people doing this job, the, the human beings behind the lines in a spreadsheet, um, motivating them, improving their sense of intrinsic motivation seems to be an important way to get a better final product. So, you know, if you're working in a restaurant and there's, an intense care about giving good customer service and it runs throughout <laughs> when it runs throughout everyone who works there then you reach a point where it becomes sort of part of the character of the organization the, the culture is a little bit the personality of an organization um now there seems to be good evidence that good ex good customer experience and good workplace culture are inter interrelated with each other mm -hmm. sometimes if you go into a shop if you go into a restaurant you can often detect the workplace culture by the experience that you have in there. If no one's smiling, if everyone, you know, if every question you have about items on the menu is met with a sort of a growl, yeah, you know, <laughs> yeah. like a sort of unaccommodating no, mm -hmm. you get a sense of what it's like to work there. Mm -hmm. Whereas places that seem to be really fixated with, well, look, what do you want? Let's sort it. We can sort that. You want that added? We can sort it. It, mm. it sort of lives as part of the experience. There seems to be good evidence for that. And I guess, you know, that's one of the interesting things. Organizations that seem to prioritize the experience for their employees. If you presume that there seems to be some pass through, and let's let's say it's not 100%, but there's some pass through between, you know, the experience you give your employees and the experience they give to customers, mm -hmm. then focusing on that seems to be at least a competitive advantage. Mm. And so if you're in a world where there's lots of people doing what you do, then having better better customer experience seems to be one thing. Really wonderful um, work done on it. And I, and I love choosing examples that aren't necessarily fancy office jobs because not necessarily because I think this degrades the evidence, but I think this suggests how universal it is. There's a, a wonderful academic at Massachusetts Institute of Technology. She started off as a professor of operations, just literally about how we get cans to the shelf and from the shelf to the shopping basket. And uh, and she worked out that companies who set about in retail, so companies who set about giving their employees a better experience um, were more profitable and had a higher growth rate than those who didn't. Really interesting. Uh, she, she looked at a supermarket in Spain called Mercadona, and they've got such low employee turnover, they've got 2% employee turnover, that she was convinced when she put it in that it was a mistake. It's like, oh, that must be 2% a month, or that must be 2%, uh, that must be 20%, because no one in retail has that low turnover. And what she found was, the reason why they had such low turnover is because they because <coughs> they paid a good wage, and the people who work there, they all get an annual bonus at the end of it. And people really relished having this job. It was like mm -hmm. a really valued job that you held on to. 
Now, how do you get people to hold on to it? The big thing in retail is predictability of hours. So, you know, they gave employees the opportunity to switch hours. They gave them long uh, enough hours each day. They're really focused on the employee experience. Mm -hmm. Now, her, her work says firms that do that are more profitable and ha have higher growth. Now, of course, we hear of big zero hours contract retailers or you know so in the us it'd be walmart the sort of big massive employer or you know here it would be something like sports direct that employs people on zero hours doesn't that necessarily guarantee how much they're going to earn and so as a consequence of that you see two models laid out one which probably gets a lot of attention because we think well, this is how capital capitalism works amazon you go and work 12 hour shifts, you last four weeks, then you get fired. Well done, well done, welcome to capitalism. And in <laughs> fact, when you look at the ones who are doing capitalism the best, they don't have that model at all. Mm -hmm. So it's like, it's, it's a, for me, it's a really life affirming sense that sometimes doing the, the cheap and easy, the nasty thing isn't necessarily the best long term strategy. Mm -hmm. So are you saying that treating your staff, your employees, the best produces the best outcomes in terms of business in her work there yeah in mm -hmm. her work there so you know you get some extremes of this in the us in the us because there's no um universal health care you have some retail environments that give you health care if you work in starbucks in the us one of the <coughs> one of the attractions of working in starbucks in the us is that you get free health care mm -hmm. and so a lot of the investors of organizations like that say take away the health care we don't need to give these workers health care and so it becomes a big consideration mm. where do you sit on this line do you want to provide this to your workers or not provide it it's a strategic decision mm -hmm. look to extrapolate that away from the us what you often find is these organizations who say okay we want to create an experience for the people who work here which is a productive and a favorable one. I think the interesting complication for me is that there's a lot of organizations who speak that language now, but are actually overseeing a really toxic work environment. So, you know, the experience of work in the COVID era is generally longer working hours, more burnout, more fatigue. The reason why uh, the, the latest statistics out this year say that 60% of UK workers are talking about changing jobs. It's because a lot of people are in the zone where they're like, you know, <laughs> albeit I've saved my daily commute, I'm not sure if I can carry on working like this. Mm. So, you know, we've got this environment that a lot of those employers will be saying, we really care about your mental health. We really care about your experience at work. But it's not what you say, it's what you do at the end of mm. the day, right? Mm. And why are people stressed? Is it because there's higher expectations? I mean, for sure, having a big pandemic happening to you is going to add some element of stress but are employees saying okay we'll take care of you but can you do twice the amount of work you know what's what's causing the stress in the first place i think a lot of it comes down to we've um tried to preserve you know that old thing when when new technology comes along the first impl implementation of new technology mm -hmm. is generally doing what we used to do with the old technology mm -hmm. and um so you know the the evolution of from from uh, sort of steam power to electric power is a good example of that. The first machines in electric power were exactly the same. They're just huge, monstrous machines, not realizing that the benefit of electrification is that you could miniaturize everything, do things differently. And what that's what we've done here. So to some extent, we all moved to working from home. What Microsoft say is they say that the average number of meetings doubled. Um, it went up actually about one and a half times. As a result of the pandemic or just, just a, a just general people, trend? Um, just people, the amount of meetings just went up to mm -hmm. a colossal extent, largely because, and so I read something last week that said that the average executive who's in Harvard Business Review has 22 hours a week of meetings. Now, I suspect for a lot of people, they have more than that. Yeah. But so your lived experience mm -hmm. is that you're at home, got back-to-back -back meetings, Outside of those meetings, you've got emails and pings coming in. You know, the moment you've got 22 hours of, meet, of meetings a week, people start um, circling like sort of birds of prey over your calendar to try and arrange new meetings. Mm -hmm. So all of the things that you've tried to lay down little train tracks for yourself, look, okay, here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to have lunch between 12.30 and 1.30 with whoever I share a house with, or I'm going to go for a walk, or I'm going to go for a coffee mid-morning to try and see some daylight. And all of those little adaptations, the boundaries that we've learned about, 
they all get pushed over because someone says, is there any chance you can meet at one o'clock? We've got a big meeting with 12 people. That's the and only you're time. And you're like, all right then. And you do it. Yeah. And so immediately, um, indication really that a lot of people don't have any degree of control, personal control over what they do or mm. any any personal autonomy. Well, that's the definition of a toxic environment. Right. But and, disguised as productive. Right. And so it's all very benign. Mm-hmm. Someone comes to you and says, any chance you can do this? You know, the last thing you want to do, most of us want to do, is be the person saying, no, that meeting can't happen for four weeks. So it goes straight over that time that you've lined up. What and you get to the end of the day completely exhausted. And what is this about meetings? Like we all know that meetings are not necessarily the most productive. And yet there's more and more of them, as you're saying, like more than a third is being put into a person's calendar. Is it a company's way of procrastinating or lack of clarity or lack of decision making? Like what's why are we doing this? Yeah, I think what happens with meetings is they're a lot easier to do. So mm. You know, to sit down and create a written document takes an immense amount of mental time of an individual. To sit down and talk about things feels feels easier and it feels um, more easy to arrange. And so consequently, it's just the, the first thing we do. It's sort of the default setting. Mm-hmm. And the challenge with that, of course, is that they're often very unproductive. You know, you often don't get big breakthroughs of thinking at meetings. You don't necessarily go into what Cal Newport a professor from Georgetown University in Washington, but what he talks about is deep work. And what he talks about specifically with deep work is he is he says quite often breakthrough moments of thinking happen when we push through that resistance that sometimes our mm-hmm. brains offer. You're just about to start and then you're like, oh, let me just check if someone's emailed me. Precisely or that. Or if you're at home and you're working from home, let me just quickly go and make a cup of tea. Or, oh, let me just check what's happening on, on Instagram very quickly, checking for that important message from a client that somehow I messaged from Instagram. And all of a sudden, you just avoided that task altogether and 20 minutes gone by and you haven't done it. Precisely. And what he says is those moments of self-interruption generally happen when thinking's getting complicated, Mm -hmm. when you're like, okay, I can't work this Mm -hmm. out. And he says, those breakthrough moments normally happen when you push through that and you have some penny drop moment. The the concentration that you've invested in it pays off because now you're like, okay, right, I see how I can make this work. Mm -hmm. Now, meetings don't have any of those moments of deep work. They don't have any of those like big big breakthroughs. So as a consequence, Look, they're very easy to do, but they don't necessarily accomplish what we want. There's a, a brilliant TikToker and he posts a lot of these, you know, accident, ac- mm. accidental conversational things um, who it goes through things. And he posted one uh, this week, um, which is him, Fred, uh, I can't remember his, his name, Fred Elliot or something. Um, but he posted one this week, which is like someone saying, oh, we, we should put time in to have a meeting about that. And he's like, this is the time. Mm-hmm. We've got 40 minutes now. What are we doing putting time in to have a discussion about something? This is the time. And it's because, you know, when you when it gets down to it, you often feel like there's no breakthrough happening. So you're going to defer to another meeting when this breakthrough will happen. It's largely because you're expecting meetings to accomplish something that meetings generally just don't accomplish. Do you think it's because we have too many hours in the working week? Uh, possibly. I mean, look, you know, probably the big trend that you'd have expected two years ago was the movement to four day weeks. Um, and well, there's a trial in the UK right now. There's quite a few of them going mm-hmm. on. You know, I, I I do a podcast and I must get a PR pitch about a firm that's gone four day week. Mm-hmm. I get one every week. Um, so there's a lot of sort of different trials going on, more and less bigger and, bigger and smaller in scale. Um, yeah, I think a lot of people are trying to do it. There was a big push just before the pandemic. There was a, a few different organisations who were saying, look, we went to a four-day week for productivity reasons, not for uh, employee well-being reasons. There was a big push of that. Then we went into the pandemic. Interestingly, in Spain, they're using four-day week for government jobs to try and create more jobs. So it's like an employment angle there because mm. um, they've got big unemployment in Spain. But just an illustration, I think... Some of the heat has gone out of the four-day week discussion right now just because there's been so much else on the table. Mm. So what is it? Why can we not concentrate? Why is it just so hard to get into that deep state? Um, Look, you know, from a work point of view, we we don't optimise work to benefit that. We optimise work for 
instantaneous responses. If you ask employees whether they think they've got a good manager or not, one of the first things they rank in terms of whether they rate their manager is how quickly their manager gets back to them. So it's not just managers having an unreasonable expectation of workers, it's across the board. Um, we've all got a desire that when we send you a request, you know, I want you to get back to me really quickly because then I could get on with what I'm doing. So I, I think work is just optimized and built around that. Mm -hmm. And so it's, it's very difficult. If you've got people in 20 hours a week of meetings and they're on Slack or they're on Teams and they're getting pings from people all over um, and all of those things are optimized for immediacy or synchrony, like mm -hmm. synchrony because the meetings are done at the same time or immediacy, you know, fastest reply wins, then it sort of, it creates that environment really. Which is get addicted to it. I think you call it what the hurry sickness right in your book and to me when you like just using that term I was like oh my god I've got this like I'm like self-diagnosed because you get into a certain phase where it's like it's all about the speed right and I always think that there's two different ways of working so there's the deep work and then there is also the speedy responsive it's like collaborative it's like back and forth but combining those two just does not work um, but just going back to the hurry sickness I think you know we're just so used to just like, and the next thing, and the next thing, and the next thing. And you never really pause and stop and actually like even reflect on what you're doing mm. or why you're doing that. And, um, but yeah, maybe you can talk a little bit more about that. Yeah, I, I think it's, you know, it's, it's increasingly observed really that mm -hmm. we are optimized for, you know, to the extent that it's, it's almost like so self-evident is about three or four books out at the start of this year, mm -hmm. just talking specifically about how uh, attention has, has become Focus in those ways. I think there's there's a danger that we can get, you know, with all of that stuff that's written, we can get too extreme about it. I think there are moments where there's good evidence that when teams are able to interact with each other very quickly, they often they have very productive moments. And so, you know, what you discover is um, sometimes it's called burstiness, but like when there's sort of very fast, rapid interactions between teams, mm -hmm. it tends to be. In, in the manner of like engaging dialogue or discussion or sort of, you know, you can get things done. There are things to be said for that line of working. Mm -hmm. Challenge is when we're trying to do that all the time. Mm -hmm. So what you might do is you might say, look, here's how our team works. Uh, we're going to keep magic time in our team. It's every day. Everyone has got two o'clock to three o'clock set aside, either for phone calls with each other, with Teams chats, Slack chats, pings, quick spontaneous five minute meetings, uh, you know, group discussions. We're gonna keep that open every day. No one can schedule anything there, but we might line up little conversations and, and a, or aim to sort of have everyone cameras on for an hour, just working together. Mm -hmm. You might see, seek to experiment with things like that because um, that burstiness does seem to have good research behind it. It's just when we try to make the whole working week look like that, that I think it becomes exhausting. It's hard to switch in between though, I it find. It is, it is definitely, mm. it is. Mm. This is one of the challenges. Here's an interesting part of the discussion right now. So, so where we are broadly is that almost every organisation, um, certainly in sort of the UK, but beyond the UK, is now debating hybrid working. So where we've been for the last two years is that actually while we've heard the phrase hybrid working a lot for the last two years, we've been very much in fully remote. A few people went back to the office for a few weeks last summer, didn't last very long. Those who did have got some war stories to share. What they say is, okay, we tried out Wednesday, Thursday, Friday in the office, or we tried out two days a week in the office. What we discovered was, because some of our colleagues were at home on those times, mm. we were going into the office and doing video calls and doing video calls at home where you can do it in the corner of the kitchen with a pair of headphones on is one thing. Doing it headphones in the middle of an open, plot, open plan of office with headphones on is a lot more exhausting. Mm -hmm. You know, you feel like you're actually in a call center. You feel like, mm -hmm. you feel like, why have I come all the way in to do video calls with people at home? Mm -hmm. You know, the things I heard, I dealt with a really big retail firm and one of, the, <laughs> one of the lead managers there said, you know, I came in, I did seven hours of video calls where I was just waving at colleagues all day uh, as they walked past me. He said, you know, the reason why I'd come in was to interact with people, have a laugh with people, discussions, I didn't do any of that. And I think that's what a lot of people are going to discover, that actually hybrid working isn't necessarily the best of both worlds. It's the worst of both worlds. Mm -hmm. It's sort of 
dialing into someone in their home office. Because all of a sudden you're in a completely different mindset as well, yeah. right? Like you expect that you're at home, you're going to be doing your deep work and yet you're collaborating, but you're collaborating with tools that are actually not as effective, mm. say, if you were in person. So, yeah, no, I definitely see the the challenges and the yeah. issues there. So what's the way forward? I think, Do, you Should know, we all go back into the office? But that won't, ha that won't happen, you mm. know, and... and the a large number of organizations have come to me and said, how do we get people back five days a week? What you find is that when you drill into those 60% of people who uh, are debating moving jobs, often what runs mm -hmm. through their experience is they say, I used to have two hours a day commuting. Now I've saved that time and my family have benefited. Or I saved that time and I'm actually for the first time getting good sleep. Mm -hmm. Or I've saved that time and I've realized I've got my job done my team's achieved great results, but I didn't have the constant stress of tearing down to the bus stop, getting on the bus, running in the office door. We've we've removed one layer of that sort of adrenalized stress from a lot of people's lives. They're not willing to go back five days a week, Large, you know, largely because as well. I've been um, back in October last year, I did a few real life conferences back in sort of conference halls with people. And um, one of the things that I saw there was that companies would show their results for the last year. And the results were fantastic, up 20%, up 15%. It's not like we've seen a failure of business where everyone needs to go back instantly just about to keep the lights on. Mm -hmm. And so that's a really important context. We're not going to go back to five days a week. And there is definitely a, a generation of leaders who believe that probably in a year, I chatted to the chief exec this Tuesday, who said, in two years, this will all be forgotten. We'll be back five days a week. Of course, you know, if you believe it, you believe that you can manifest it. You believe that you can make these things happen. That's not going to happen. So um, almost certainly what we've witnessed about firms who want to do that, they'll have to pay their workers 30 to 40% more than. So it could well be that, you know, maybe some of the big banking firms say, look, we've just made a call on it. We're going to, it's five days a week in the office. That's our culture. Mm -hmm. But here's the extra cash. And that may be a decision. People who, you know, work in that environment generally are sort of money uh, orientated for that. So it could well be that those work for the vast majority of workers. That isn't going to work. So then it becomes an exercise of right. How do we work out? Number one, what was the office for? Mm -hmm. But the office broadly had five, five and a half roles to it: place to, to meet people by appointment, place to meet people by accident, um, place to it was a place to get our work done. So if you if you ever worked with colleagues who edited videos and they had big screens or they had you know hard drives, you know often it was a workshop to get our work done. Uh, the office was a place of team cohesion, it was sort of like the church. It was the it was the 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 mosque. It was the coming together of people. Uh, the final one is the office was a place of learning, and you know a lot of it. Seventy percent of all the learning that we do in our job doesn't happen in training sessions or in sort of specific learning environments. It just happens mm -hmm. casually while we're, we're getting on. There's a final one, which the office, I think increasingly important, but the office is an embodiment of our organization. So, you know, increasingly in a world where maybe companies are going to be saying we're really green, well, their office is going to have to be this embodiment of that. Mm -hmm. You know, we're a really green organization. When you come here in, we do this. Um, so, but once you know those things, Probably the things that are most important for us thinking about how we can navigate to the way that work looks in the future are meeting people by accident uh, and being a, a place of team cohesion. And the meeting people by accident is really critical. There's lots of lovely research that says the casual conversations that happen, the things that people have been romanticizing the last two years do seem to have a value to them. They do seem to have a, an uplift one of the, the people who studied this the most says what these sort of encounters are way more effective than meetings or emails mm -hmm. for moments of creative breakthrough. So what you might say is, OK, so we know that that's important. We also know that making the team feel part of something is really important. But the question is, do we need to, <coughs> do we need to do that four days a week? Do we need to do it three days a week? Do, could we do it two days a week? And, you know, the things I always think about there are how often do you see your best friends? And can you keep a sense of connection with them? How often, you know, most religions worked on the basis that once a week was enough, once every two weeks was probably okay. And so, you know, this idea that we need to go three days a week into the office, 
I suspect will fade over time. Mm. That's what I would guess. I think it's the intention, isn't it? Mm. It's the intention. You've realized the things that you were missing about what you didn't have. And I think this is what the pandemic is showing us. It's like the things that were not working that we need to fix and the things that we didn't even realize that was so good for us. I mean, one of the things is, you know, talking about sort of serendipity or bumping into someone having these small interactions, you know, it also floods us with oxytocin mm. when we have these interactions where we do feel part of the community. It's like saying hello to the person that makes your coffee mm. in the morning, like being part of, you know, a village that you live in, that you feel that you belong. And I think that sense of belonging has become threatened when we are not in the office. So it's like with the hybrid work, there's so much thought that needs to go into it's like exactly what you're saying about you know is it two days is it three days and it's like when we come in that's what we're going to be focusing on that's what we're going to be doing rather than just replicating what we were doing before but yeah. just in different locations yeah the, you know so i um, i'm constantly on the lookout for firms that i think okay they seem to have got it well mm. uh, and i this one organization i saw a marketing organization they said our culture experiment i think everyone's in the stage right now yeah. where they're just experimenting but as is Wednesday plus one. And uh, it's the first time that I thought, okay, they seem to understand. So Wednesday, because everyone's going to be in on Wednesday. And so, you know, you're going to meet everyone there. So maybe don't fill your diary with back-to-back -back meetings on a Wednesday. It may be the implication you might, you mm -hmm. might take. Plus one, but we don't want the office to be empty every other day. So pick a day, you know, actually people could can find out, oh, that's the day that George is in the office. And so... Okay, well, I'll go in. I'll, I'll catch up with George that day. Um, and but for me, that was the first one that seems to understand the way that our relationship with the commute has fundamentally changed. Mm -hmm. I wouldn't, I wouldn't underestimate that. You know, people who've got a long commute, their relationship with it was already conflicted, but they understood that it was a trade-off. Mm -hmm. That either they had a better quality of life, but or they they could live in a nicer place, or they mm -hmm. had commitments and they could respect their commitments by doing that. Um, and I think, you know, now we look at that and we think it was collective insanity. The mm -hmm. idea that we were spending 20 hours a week commuting, that's mm -hmm. fundamentally changed. Mm -hmm. And I think it, it's why a lot of people have got resistance to going back to work the way it was before. Mm. Let's talk about your new book that's coming out, Fortitude. Like what, what made you decide to write it and uh, why now? Yeah. So it's a book about resilience mm -hmm. and it's a book about resilience is sort of this interesting strange will-o'-the-wisp of a concept. It's like this magical, mythical thing that some of us are told that we need to be resilient. And uh, when, you're Toughen up. when you're instructed <laughs> to be resilient, mm -hmm. you don't know what the first action you're meant to take is. It just means to, it's, it seems to be an implication sometimes to just get a thicker skin, mm -hmm. you know, just deal with failure. Why can't you just, and what you find is that that runs throughout the uses of it. Um, people just often tell others to be resilient. Well, look, it's time for them to be resilient. You know, something's gone wrong. A disaster's happened somewhere in the world. And, you know, our expectation is, well, they're just going to have to be resilient. Mm -hmm. And broadly, it, resilience is like this thing that we just kind of use to shoo people away. You know, it's like, go and be, go off and be resilient, please. Go. Is it because you, the person themselves doesn't want to face the challenges and the difficulties the other person is facing? I think it poses big questions. Mm. Like, you know, why is this person mm. having this misfortune? Why are they suffering again? You know, it, it, uh, it prevents you from having to sort of question that yourself. Mm. Anyway, what you find about resilience is that firstly, the whole book is sort of an exploration into firstly, what the big iconic models of resilience are. And broadly, you know, most time you hear about resilience work, it's based on the work of a very famous psychologist called Martin Seligman, almost without exception. Everything you hear is based on that. These two big offshoots directly spun up from his work that people sometimes know about. Growth mindset is, is broadly an adapted discussion about resilience and uh, grit, which is uh, by Angela Duckworth, is not another adaptation of that. And so firstly, I'm just intrigued. Let's delve into what the research is. The reason why is because I know no shortage of people, whether school children or friends who've worked in companies, who've been on resilience training and have told me at the end of it, nothing's changed. I don't feel any more resilient. But worse, I press the resilience button on my seat. Nothing happened. It's like I pulled the parachute. Nothing happened. Mm. Now I feel worse. 
think that's the same thing as saying be happy. Like you're not going to be feeling that. Yeah. Because resilience to some extent is a feeling, right? It's an internal thing of how your personal emotional response towards a challenge and how you feel about it. Because, you know, something, you know, one thing could be, oh, it's easy for me. But for another person, it could be, you know, fundamentally something that they just emotionally cannot cope with. And if someone says, well, be more resilient, that's not going to make you. That's just mm. going to make you feel... Like you don't, you're not un not being understood. You're not connected with. Like you didn't understand what my problem was in the first place. And I think if we shut down that part of us, you know, being able to understand where it comes from, then it becomes even more difficult being resilient because then it's like this kind of almost like learned helplessness. Well, I can't do anything about it because people just tell me to just be okay with it, mm. and so and I'm not okay with it. I must be a terrible person, and it just goes into this vicious. Um, but Cycle. imagine this is like a, a metaphor then. So mm. if you said to me, I want to be taller. Mm. And I said, great, I've got a module that's going to make you taller. Mm. And I'm going to bring you into a room. I'm going to train you on this tallness. And at the end of it, you're not taller. You shrunk. <laughs> what it's done mm. is it's transferred the responsibility for being taller from, you know, mm. outside or from like the environment we're in, transferred it to you. And this is what happens with the resilience training. Mm -hmm. It transfers the responsibility of being resilient to the individual. And it's why a lot of people, when they go through resilience training, at the end of it, like, oh, I'm so glad I did that. I'm so glad I did that. And they're sort of anxiously thinking, I feel no different. Mm -hmm. Now, what, you, what I've spent a long time, spent two years going through, is countless examples of people being resilient. You know, one of the leading experts studying resilience is a woman and she describes it as a woman called Anne Marston. And she describes it as ordinary magic. It exists, resilience exists everywhere around us. What you find though, is resilience, if we're trying to perceive it as an individual characteristic trait or state, doesn't exist. Why? Because it's a collective thing. So what you find is that, you know, you look at the people, really interesting studies. You look at the people who experienced 9-11 or watched 9-11 on TV. So, witnessing the same things broadly but the people who were there um they reported a sort of collective calm on the streets there's a sense of community people were you know buying beers in the street and sort of ch chatting and talking to each other people there was a, a a strong sense of connection the people who watched it on tv were in a state of fearful panic their anxiety oh my god what's happening now the fundamental difference is not necessarily what they've witnessed. In fact, you know, the people who were on the streets of New York that day clearly witnessed it in a far more vivid sense. But it's the fact that they shared it with other people. And look, so like, you know, an old example, but there's countless other examples of people who go through um, shared experiences, whether they're natural disasters like earthquakes, tsunamis or wars, you know, man-made disasters. Generally, what you find is that the people who go through those things have got sort of this remarkable ability to cope. These um, a really uh, famous expert who studied natural disasters ended up working for the, the U.S. military, and he said he said basically he would fly into war zones. So you know something's just happened in Tonga. I'm getting on the first plane to Tonga. I'm flying to Tonga, trying going to observe what was there. And he set about. He was hired by the U.S. military to try and observe how mass panic happened. Mm -hmm. After about 45 of these 4 a.m. phone calls and flights somewhere, he said mass panic doesn't happen in natural disasters. In fact, far from it, it's the opposite. A sense of solidarity, of connectedness, of community happens. Right, that's a really fundamental understanding. Now, why is that not helpful for organizations? It's because rather than resilience being something that can send you on a training module yourself, it means it's something that they need to cultivate collectively. And it fundamentally raises the, the question on that. There was a big issue with about uh, 20 years ago now, there was a big issue in the NHS where West Dorset Health Authority were told by the health and safety executive that they had a toxic culture that was causing outbreaks of stress that were off the charts. And they were told, it's your responsibility to deal with this. And their response, really starting a trend that's happened for the last 20 years, their response was to send all their workers on resilience training. So fundamental reframing, not that we've got a toxic culture, but our people aren't tough enough to deal with it. Mm -hmm. You know, Not that we've created something that's horrible, unsustainable, unendurable, unnatural, but 
oh, I wish we'd hired better people. Mm-hmm. And it's a it's a brilliant reframing. Why aren't you tall enough? Because I've sent you on the tallness training now. Why aren't you tall enough? Mm-hmm. Um, it's a brilliant reframing. So what you find is countless examples of uh, resilience, but they generally are when people feel connected, supported, and you're in it together absolutely right? it's a social, as you said it's like it's a collective it's a social experience where it's not just down to you but you're doing it for something that's bigger than you yeah. rather than just for yourself when we're talking about earlier about having these disparities between salaries the example was with the company that just decided to make everyone on the same salary it was like what is it like seventy thousand. i thought that was a really interesting yeah experiment we occasionally see examples of that mm-hmm. so the total radical transparency there's a few organizations <laughs> there's a few organizations that do it um there's a few that publish all of their salaries on a website you know so you can go you can mm-hmm. go in everyone's salary is listed there they tend to be the exception rather than the the norm but you know it's it's an interesting experiment I'm not sure it accomplishes exactly what they want inside an organization. We, de- we tend to sort of, as soon as you bring numbers into relationships, it sort of changes things, you know. Um, as soon as you sort of know exactly what each of your colleagues is earning, I don't think it necessarily reduces frictions between people, but rather sort of, in my experience, grows them. So, mm. yeah, But interesting, like, there's a lot of people who are tackling things like that. Mm. So talking about, again, you know, back to resilience and how this plays out in terms of being sort of a collective as a social thing like what should leaders be thinking about and doing based on that well so broadly if you find that resilience is a collective thing then you might be asking right okay how can i make sure that my team feel connected with each other um the the way that i've framed fortitude resilience is based on three things and probably it's it's not worth underestimating the 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 other two so the first one is personal control um you know if you if you're the sort of person who opens your calendar on a sunday night just to have a peek at what horrors lie ahead and you've got 40 hours of back-to-back meetings and someone's put a meeting over your lunchtime walk and the time that you're meant to be going to collect something for someone there's a meeting over the top of it then no matter how connected to other people you feel no matter how robust you might feel about your life in other ways um that lack of personal control is probably the biggest predictor for human well-being so you know and it, it has remarkable effects people who have no autonomy in their jobs generally become more authoritarian parents people who have no autonomy in their jobs uh, are more likely to have children who become school bullies. So, like, there's a remarkable sort of ripple effect of mm. these things, how they impact upon us. People who've got no control in their jobs generally fall foul of, of illness and sickness far more. So personal control has, you know, just an incredible impact on our whole life, really. Mm. The other two elements are that sense of community and the, finally, a sense of personal identity. And that's really critical. There's so many extraordinary stories about when people feel clearer about who they are, it has um, an impact on the the way that they can perceive themselves and carry themselves. The, the worst example of it is that when HIV AIDS first came along, men who were not open about their sexuality and didn't tell people about their sexuality, and as a result, seem to demonstrate in the research that they were conflicted about their identity Mm -hmm. and fell ill with HIV AIDS quicker than people who were open with their identity. So like there's just extraordinary examples of that. I I love looking at the the stories of people who really have used identity enrichment, really, identity revitalization to lift themselves. And you see quite often with um, elite athletes, quite often elite athletes, major piece of work they've got significant moments of childhood trauma in fact a big piece of work um done uh about sort of six seven years ago now tracked the highest performing british olympians and found that out of the 16 who were tracked all of them had significant childhood trauma but what they'd done is they'd used their capacity to be good at sport to become their identity. Mm-hmm. So yeah, they might have had something really horrible happen to them, but now they became focused on, I'm going to be an elite sports person. Mm-hmm. Now, actually, in that story, there's a lot of misexperience, right? There's a lot mm-hmm. of misfortune. Someone who's directing all of their sadness into a new identity, that's not necessarily the model of 
a happy life. Yeah. But it's an illustration that when we can, when we've got a strong identity, it can be enriching for us. Mm. I read a, a study which was looking at the number of prime ministers and people who get to the top. And in quite a lot of them, there was a trauma, especially losing a primary parent, usually the mother, and how that also shaped the person and having to overcome something so significantly challenging very early in your life, how then got you to build your sense of identity yeah. on trying to get yourself to either a status or wealth or pinnacle of success yeah. that you perceive it to be. So that's precisely what mm -hmm. I go into in the book. Mm -hmm. um, but, you know, it's worth saying that that misfortune and it's you know it runs amongst all of these people one survey of famous writers in just after the second world war mm -hmm. found that half of them had lost a, a parent mm -hmm. um, early and jean paul sartre famous french sort of writer philosopher he said the best thing that a father can do for his child's success is to die early so you know this sort of a, there's a grim trend mm -hmm. there mm -hmm. but i think you know the point that i've got when i explore it in the book is that it often leaves a leaves a void at the heart of people's mm -hmm. lives you know none of the people who go through that experience would describe the later accomplishment that they achieve as in any way filling the void that was left when they, mm. they lost someone. And also, sadly, majority of the people who go through that experience don't get to be the top CEO or prime that. minister. So you have a lot of Survivors other individuals. Bias. Exactly. So there must be some other element to it that gets people to the top rather than just, you know, having... It's the intersection, as the elite sports people show, it's the intersection of a singular talent and some moment of misfortune. So you were coincidentally um, probably a remarkably good tennis player and you were also present at the only mass school shooting in UK history. Mm. And so as a consequence, you know, Andy Murray becomes one of the greatest British sports people of all time. These things often have an intersection where it's, it's one in a, a thousand talent combined with a moment of misfortune. Mm. Well, I think it's it comes to do with change as well. I think if you, you want to quit smoking or you want to, I don't know, start your own business or leave a relationship that's not working, majority of the people make that change when it's so bad or something significant happens in their life. There's some sort of like a very strong negative emotional experience rather than when you've just simply decided to. That. I'd love to see more studies looking into how, without going through trauma, and without having something that's, you know, really challenging or you're just stuck in a really bad, you know, terrible mental state, how we can actually make change and and, and get there mm. without having to go through these kind of experiences. Yeah. So, and that's all about, so how then can we nourish people's sense of identity? How can we use those things that catalyze the extreme performance in those people and <laughs> and what are the ways that we can catalyze that to achieve it? Barack Obama, in his first memoir, talks about how he was raised, Barack Obama, albeit that he's mixed race, with an African father, an American white mum, he was raised entirely by his white mum and his white grandparents in Hawaii, which is not a place riven with race conflict. And so as a consequence, when he reached the age of, sort of 18, 19, 20 at college, he was surrounded with young black men who he didn't identify with at all. And, you know, in his biography, he talks about how he actually put himself in conflict with these people because he thought their the way they were styling themselves was performative and exaggerated. And, and he got into big arguments with them. And it's because he was like, he was having these conflicts of identity. Of, like, these people have got a really clearly articulated identity. I don't connect with it at all. And so he described, actually, he went through several years feeling lost, lonely, insecure, anxious, until he then started doing community work and volunteered in Chicago. And then he felt a sense of, back to your point earlier, a sense of calling, connection, you know, a, a sense of sort of mission, purpose about what he was doing. But, you know, it's really interesting. We see whether someone has experienced misfortune or hasn't, normally it's about how they reflect on their own personal identity that is a really important catalyst. Mm, I'm a total believer in that. I was also doing Tony Robbins sessions yesterday and he was talking, I don't remember exactly the quote, but it's like identity is the most powerful force in creating the dream life that you have or something along those lines. And I've read some of Gretchen Rubin's work about the four tendencies and I, I'm a rebel. Uh, there's four tendencies. I won't go into too much detail there, but rebels are resistant to 
external expectations and the internal expectations. And so even if you set something in the diary that you wanted to do, you know, all of a sudden when you don't feel like it, you, you don't do it. But if you create an identity of like, well, I'm a person that is, um, you know, action taker or family man, family woman, then that sense of identity actually helps you to mm. get things done. So I'm absolutely a believer yeah. in that. Bruce, where can our listeners, our viewers, where can they find you? Probably best place, I mean, I'm, I'm on social media, but best place is my website, Eat, Sleep, Work, Repeat. It's named after my podcast. And so, yeah, all of my stuff's there. So I do a newsletter every couple of weeks about the latest research and how work's changing. I do a podcast about it at the same frequency as well. So we're trying to understand, you know, chatting to people who are doing the research about how likely are we to go back to the office more? Will there be some firms who go back all the time? What does what industries are going back more? Just wrestling with those things, really. Mm. Bruce, thank you so much. Thank you. Such a pleasure to have you here. And um, thank you so much for your insights. Fascinating. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for joining us here on Anatomy of a Leader. What did you discover in this episode? I'd love to hear your thoughts in the comments below. And if you haven't already, hit that subscribe button and I'll see you next week.